Captain Nicola Goddard commanded this crew of soldiers, my guys, as she called them. They were a forward observation party, or foo team. Their job, to call in fire missions and direct that fire with pinpoint accuracy, one of the most dangerous units in the military. Over the months, they became a kind of tight set piece, complementing each other, looking out for each other. And by this time, Captain Goddard had their trust and respect. Sergeant Dave Redford, six foot four and the oldest member of the team. Redford had already served in Croatia and Bosnia, and Nicola leaned on his war experience, becoming her most trusted ally and friend in Afghanistan. Redford recalls his first impression of Nicola and her potential to lead. We saw this person coming towards us on the other side of the building and she had no hair. So I said to my buddy, hey, let's just kind of go off this way. And so we kind of made a beeline for another kind of direction and avoided her. And then uh, a couple days later, uh, I met her and uh, realized that she had shaved her head for a charity event because she had done a few things with her, you know, shaving of her head. And I kind of thought that was pretty ballsy and uh, kind of thought we would work well together. Once we get set in our position of overwatch, the rest of call signs... This footage was captured in the weeks before her death. It's telling now to watch the crew huddle together and being briefed by Nicola, self-assured, confident, just doing her job. Listening closely is master bombardier Jeff Fair. Fair was the team's gunner, the young, no-nonsense soldier from small-town Manitoba with a can-do attitude Nicola relied on. Fair called Nicola the boss, as did the rest of the team. Her disarming smile is what he remembers most. To be honest, when I heard she was on, uh, she was one of the foos, I was pretty happy. And, and uh, it was weird, no matter what happened, uh, we could have been rolling through whatever and been covered head to toe in that damn dust. And she'd take her mask off and you would just see nothing but dirt and then just that damn grin. And she just, I think she just loved it over there. She loved the experience. Bombardier Clinton Gingrich was the driver for the crew, a solid, soft-spoken man, and the same age as Nicola Goddard, 26 years old. Gingrich liked the idea of working with a close-knit team and found great comfort in it. For us, it was great because everyone liked each other. It would, if, if there was issues, it would, it would really suck because you're stuck with those people the whole tour. But, but uh, I don't know, it was nice, just you felt like, not, like you weren't by yourself, I guess. Fact is, Nicola Goddard led an all-male crew in a highly male-dominated field. It clearly posed no issues for her soldiers, but the possibility a decision she made could jeopardize the rest of her team did weigh on her. Interesting to hear her express that fear not long before she was killed. My, my big concern is, is for my crew, so I guess it's uh, um, the, the big pressure's on me is if, if I make a call and it's the wrong call, so I won't know that until I do it, and then you just hope for the best after, I guess. So that, that, for me, that's my biggest concern. I know my guys know what to do. I got no worries with them, so. I think because she was a female, she always felt that she had to really kind of, um, she didn't have to always prove everything, but she just didn't want to make a mistake. And I think that was the kind of the key to, to why she was so driven. It was what it was. She was the boss. I mean, yeah, I, don't, as I can't say for the other guys, but it was never really an issue. As the mission wore on, the team became more aware of the dangers. Gunner Jeff Fair decided to give Nicola his just-in-case letter. At the time, Nicola wrote home, saying she was moved Jeff would trust her with that letter. That's a tough one, I don't know. I, I assumed that if something happened, she would be the one to come out of it. I don't know why, I don't know why I felt that way or thought that way, but uh, I figured she'd be the one that would make it home out of all of us. 
May 17, 2006, Captain Goddard and her crew ready their light armored vehicle for the day's mission. Bombardier Chris Goche was the last member to join Goddard's crew only a month before they were deployed. He arrived with experience in Bosnia and was a confident, opinionated, old school soldier. And yet Goche surprised himself, settling perfectly into the five member crew. Goche remembers that morning and feeling unnerved by what he saw while heading into the field. They always say if you see a, a trail of people, uh, especially women and children, hightailing it out of there, uh, you're pretty well going into hostile territory. So it uh, sort of heightens your, your, uh, your uh, senses sort of thing and awareness of uh, what's going on. And I was literally just sitting out in the open and I remember her telling me to put my helmet on. She said, put your helmet on, it's important. So, okay, kind of, you know, at the time I kind of rolled my eyes and put it on and... We were both standing up in the turret, um, probably both that high. Uh, and uh, she was telling me how proud she was of, of him, how proud she was of us, how it was a great day, we got the mission, and then... I just remember just this cloud of white and uh, just this concussion like, like you were hit by a car or something. And uh, all I could hear is uh, call signs being flown around the radio. And I said, like, just why the hell isn't she answering? And that's when I left the machine gun alone for a sec and I popped back down and looked over her side of the lab and that's when I saw her. So she, uh, she was just sort of slumped up leaning against, uh, against her side of the lab. I, I could see she was bleeding. Um, I, I, I put two and two together. I knew we got hit by an RPG, but seeing her uh, sort of um, reaffirmed it was from her, it was her side that got hit. Um, and that was a big wow. You know, holy hell, this is this just this is this is really happening now. Uh, we roll back into this position, and um, over the over the roar of the labs and and the bisons, um, people could still hear me and Chris leaning over the side of the lab, screaming for a medic over all that noise. So. Um, but by this time, she was gone, so. It's not that we just didn't want anybody putting her on the plane, it's that we wanted to be a part of it, so. It took everything we had not to break down. Uh, I think uh, me and one of the other guys were talking after that we almost bit through our cheeks just trying to hold it together. For me, that was a realization that this was the, uh, the final stage of uh, uh, her in, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, once we got into the back of the plane, that's, uh, that's, that's where a few of us sort of fell apart. But. In the six years since Nicola died, some of her crew still wrestle with what happened that day, while some are just grateful to be alive. All of them agree they were lucky to know and be led by Captain Goddard. I'm just, I'm just ready for her to, to finally be able to rest and put the story behind everybody and 
just sort of move on. She spent her career trying to not stand out, just to stand out after the fact. It sort of goes against the type of person she was, so. Like, like she would be the first degree. There's 157 other people that didn't come home, so. Still ahead on this special hour. I just feel thankful for everyone that fights in the war. We take you inside the Calgary School named in honor of Captain Goddard to see how its students are paying tribute to her legacy. But next. I was proud of her for going and trying to make a difference. For the first time, Victoria and Kate Goddard speak publicly about the loss of their big sister. Oh, that sweater. I remember that sweater. We have a new curriculum. How do we teach it? And the surprising way Nicola's dad is carrying on his daughter's work. I think of you all often, and I can't wait to see you all again. I hope that life on the home front is interesting as usual, and that you are all remembering to smile. Another excerpt from the letters of Captain Nicola Goddard. In May of 2006, she had been in Afghanistan for a few months. The mission was going well for her. Then came the day that changed everything. Once again now, Red Sharon. soldier on operations today was killed at approximately 6.55 p.m. This young lady was a true Canadian, serving her country. Nicola was doing a job that she liked, she loved. I don't really know, uh, Tim, how to yeah, ask you about uh, when you found out what had happened. Ah, <laughs> oh, it's easy enough. Uh, it was my birthday. <laughs> there was a message from son-in-law Jason. I phoned him back and he just said, Nicholas has been killed. And uh, we've... And uh, kind of the roof fell in, right? Tim rushed to the school where Sally was working. When I saw Tim... It, it was just... You knew. We, to a certain extent, yes. And then there's the feeling of suspended disbelief. The Canadian forces lost another soldier in combat. Captain Nicola Goddard is the 17th Canadian to die in Afghanistan and the first female member of the Canadian forces killed in action. It was really quite amazing how she seemed to have touched everybody. There was an incredible media coverage, uh, both in, in TV and radio and, and in the newspapers. The plane carrying her home was delayed, arriving late into the night. There was speculation in the media who were being kept outside the fence that it was an attempt by the government to manage an increasingly sensitive situation. Even so, people waited hours along the Highway of Heroes to pay their respects. We came out and all along the fence there were all these people with Canadian flags and I had no idea that they were there. And that just, that, that really got to me. The family's grief would play out in front of the cameras. She died too young, but she died doing something she believed was important. Her funeral took place on a rainy May morning in the same church where she had been married almost four years before. It was televised live across the country as they said goodbye to their firstborn. But I would urge you to remember our beautiful girl, not just as a soldier, not just as the first Canadian woman killed in combat, but as a person with passion, 
one with a great enthusiasm for life. Yours was a short life, but a good one. You had so much promise, so much potential, and the world is a far lesser place with your passing. Her final resting place would be the National War Cemetery in Ottawa. Come on, go. Look at this, what a beautiful day. That was six years ago. They call Prince Edward Island home now. We were finding ourselves becoming um, more and more burdened by memories. Moving to Prince Edward Island has given us a new start. But almost daily, condolences or tributes still find them. There was stuff everywhere. A friend, an elder, gave Sally some good advice. She said, Nicola needs to know that you're, that you're going to be all right. And the only way she's going to do that is if you stop being upset every time. You see something. Nicola's got to rest. And uh, so we started. We started putting everything in a box. It helps, but their grief never rests for long. I suppose, I mean, it's hard all the time, really. We were talking about it the other night, and we were talking about how um, Kate looks like Nicola, um, or has, and Victoria has flashes of Nicola. Um, So collectively, she's with us all the time. I think that's my favorite picture. The girls, sisters Kate and Victoria, have never spoken publicly about the loss of their big sister. Oh, that sweater. I remember that sweater. It's one of those things that it settles into a, this sort of a quiet place. And every once in a while, we'll kind of come leaping up and grapple with you again. And sometimes, you know, as anything. Yeah. You just think of somebody, and that's when it comes. I don't know if that's me or you, actually. Processing their sister's very public death has not been easy. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're all wearing the matching dresses for Fiona's wedding. Yeah. <laughs> but now she inspires them to live every day. I was proud of her for going and trying to make a difference. You know, that, that's important to me. I think one of the, the really important legacies that, that Nick left is that it reinforced the idea for me, and I think for a lot of people, that you can make an impact. And then the shipyards that those kind of buildings up there, the green. Their big sister continues to make an impact. What has been built in her memory is a legacy that's unprecedented. A new Coast Guard vessel, part of the Hero class, is under construction in Halifax. It will be called the Captain Nicola Goddard. There are memorials like this one at her high school in Antigonish, or in fact at playgrounds, parks and schools right across the country. There have been songs sung and books written. And there's Nicola's Legacy Foundation, offering scholarships at two universities and funding a lighting program at first aid posts and rural aid centers in her birthplace, Papua New Guinea. Then there are those boxes full of the caring thoughts and condolences of a nation. Stuff has gradually come out. Um, it gets easier. I hope that the new year will bring to our world the promise of peace for which Nicola died.
we're nowhere near ready to empty the box. You know, it may never be. It may never be. Still, every gesture reminds them how many people their daughter touched in her young life. But perhaps the greatest tribute to what his daughter stood for comes from dad himself. Dad, the educator, has been spending a lot of time in Ottawa. We have a new curriculum. How do we teach it? Working with Afghan professionals to develop better education programs. Even traveling to Afghanistan to help implement them now that it's safe enough to do his part in his daughter's memory. She felt it was her job to get us to that state. And I, I think the fact that in a way, she's passed the torch. She's, but yeah, maybe that's that's one way of looking at it. The 157 others who lost their lives in Afghanistan are never far from their thoughts. We've lost some very good, bright young men and women, and that's sad, I think, for us. But it's in the quiet moments, a walk along the beach, that they remember her best. Soldier, leader, sister, daughter, wife, all those things. I, I think her legacy is everywhere. She's always going to be 26. And I think that's how we remember her. You know, we remember her in those years leading up to being 26. And, um, you know, we smile. One of her friends, she said that uh, there are two kinds of people, though, those, those who knew Nicola and those who wish they did. And, uh, yeah. Nicola's dad will return to Afghanistan again later this week.